Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for coming, hearing me talk. Um, today, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, my journey, really, and what I've learned um, from interviewing uh, a number of uh, sort of successful open source creators and maintainers. So, yep, yeah, I'm going to give you the five lessons that I've learned um, from interviewing successful commercial open source founders um, for the podcast that I started. Um, my lesson 0.5, if you're British, don't start a podcast. Um, it's, it's really embarrassing uh, when you tell people that you've got one and um, the imposter syndrome is very strong. So, yeah, who am I? Uh, I'm old enough that this was my first computer. It, it had a three megahertz processor and was amazing. Um, I studied AI here in Birmingham University uh, at the depths of uh, one of the AI winters. Um, there were zero AI jobs when I graduated, which is uh, a sign of the times, I guess. This was my gateway drug uh, into open source software. Back at university, we had dial-up modems, and there was a, a Slackware CD on the front of a magazine. And um, we couldn't believe that you know, we could put it on our local desktop machines at home and um, you know, write code without having to go into a university lab and sit in front of a, a Sonos terminal. And this was the first job that I had out of university. I was working for the BBC. That was what their homepage looked like in 1997. Um, yeah, so quite a long time ago. Right now, uh, I'm yeah, co-founder and CEO uh, of Flagsmith. So we are a commercial open source feature flagging, remote config, and AV testing service. Um, we're, we're sort of bootstrapped, um, just about profitable now. Um, very proud of that. Um, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, later on. Um, yeah, and you can check out our code. You can run the entire platform on your desktop with a couple of containers, uh, github.com slash flagsmith. Um, so yeah, I, why am I talking here right now? My, uh, my career as a software engineer um, was basically completely full of consuming open source software. Um, you know, occasionally we'd, the, my colleagues and I would raise bugs with open source products, projects and, um, you know, maybe add some documentation, but it was kind of 99.9% .9 consumption and, you know, 0.1% production. Um, so I thought let's, it's time to change that. I've, I've been running a software agency for 20 years and, um, we sort of thought that we have the resources to do it, a small, small private company. 12 people in London, we thought let's, let's, um, let's change that, let's start an open source project. Um, but I soon realized that I, I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I've got a lot of experience writing commercial software, um, but I had, I had no understanding of, of how open source projects worked. I'd, I'd only consumed them, I hadn't produced them. Um, and I didn't know what was okay and what wasn't okay. I didn't know if it was acceptable, you know, socially um, or ethically to, to do things or not to do things. And I just kind of assumed, you know, just, all, you know, we'll just, we'll write some code and we'll put it on GitHub and that'll be that. Surely that's the end of it, right? Or that's the beginning and everything will just start happening naturally. But I, we did, you know, we did that and nothing happened. Um, so I thought, um, I know, let's, let's start a podcast. Um, which is, is now a kind of source of personal embarrassment. Um, although I, I am proud of the, the, the content that, that, we've, that we've generated from it. I thought it would be good to, um, you know, reach out to successful founders of, of open source businesses and projects um, and find out what their stories were. How did they start? How did they build their, their projects and their communities? Um, and maybe they'll tell me. But at the time, you know, we were a pretty bad website, a pretty sort of simple open source feature flagging tool. Um, we didn't have a podcast. We didn't have any traffic. Um, you know, we didn't have any followers. We had like 30 stars on GitHub. Surely no one's going to speak to me. 
Um, and so that was lesson one that I learned, was that the, the community is amazing. So my, my, uh, one of my colleagues, Matt, um, he's American, so he just emailed a bunch of really successful people and said, will you come on our podcast? Um, and <laughs> I was sort of sitting there thinking, like, you know, no one's going to come on our podcast. Um, but they did, you know, he emailed Heather Mika. She's been instrumental in um, open source licensing. We emailed her. She said, sure, I'll come on your podcast. We emailed this guy, probably most of you recognize, uh, David Heinemeyer Hansen. He started Ruby on Rails. Emailed him and he said, yeah, sure, I'll come on your podcast. Um, and then we, you know, we emailed Michael DeHaan, um, who for some reason there in his crunch based picture looks like the fifth member of the Smiths. Um, you know, he started Ansible and he was like, yeah, I'll, I'll come on your podcast. He was actually the first guy I interviewed. And um, before I talk to people, I make a point of um, cloning their you know, m most successful GitHub repository and looking at the first few commits of, um, of that repository to see, you know, to try and get an idea from the code of how things started. And um, Michael's easily got the best first commit of any of the projects that I looked at. Unfortunately, a lot of them, you kind of feel like people have, you know, done three months of work and then pushed a whole load of code. But Michael's first commit is amazing um, for Ansible. Um, the first commit message is just Genesis. It's two files. It's a readme file and a Python file, which I don't know if you can see on the right, is 4K. Um, and so 51,000 commits later, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite a bit different. But that was a big source of inspiration to me because I thought, wow, you know, this guy just put 4K of Python up online and, and um, you know, he built a very successful project and business out of it. So that was my first lesson one, that um, the community is really amazing. And, you know, I think the only people that... that um, that turned me down were people who were working in not-for-profit organizations and the idea of the podcast was about commercial open source. Um, so yeah, so lesson two was scratch your itch. So we've been running a software agency in London and we had enterprise clients and they couldn't ship, they, we just couldn't ship software with them. It was, it was really painful. I don't know, you, you, may, you guys, maybe some people might feel the same experience where you get to the end of a sprint and we can't deploy our software that we've written because there's a, a bug somewhere else that breaks the build or um, you know, prevents things from going live and then you wait another week, the same thing happens, and then suddenly you're like, two months later, nothing's been released, everyone's freaking out, everyone knows that the next release is going to break a load of stuff because there's two months of code in it. Uh, and you're going to be working the weekend trying to put fires out. So we, we as an agency, were like, well, look, there must be a, there must be a Postgres of feature flags, right? Like, they're a fairly uh, well understood paradigm in software engineering. This was five years ago. Um, there must be a Postgres of feature flags, um, but we couldn't find one. So we thought, okay, look, this is our opportunity. Let's start building one, and we'll open source it, and um, we'll see where we go. You know, how hard can feature flags be, right? They're just booleans. Um, so we'll give it three months. Sure, it'll be done in three months. Um, and five years later, we're still working on it. Um, it turns out uh, it, it opens up sort of more interesting and, and complex problems and solutions. Um, and now, you know, there's, there's actually, you know, there's Unleash. Um, there's a bunch of uh, language-dependent projects. Um, but yeah, five years ago, we were like, okay, let's just, let's just do that. So we open sourced it. And we didn't really know where it would take us. Um, but it turned out that it's now a business that stands by itself and is starting to hire folk. Um, so I've got some, some little clips uh, from some of the folk that I've interviewed over the last couple of years for the podcast. And um, yeah, you know, reiterating the, the, the lessons that I've learned. So um, here's a clip of Mitchell Hashimoto, who, yeah, he's, he's a co founder of HashiCorp invented Vagrant and Terraform and a bunch of other uh, really transformative technology. So what, tell, tell me a little bit about the genesis of that. So, um, you know, what, what gave you the, was there, a, was there anything that influenced 
simple, but it kind of sparked that idea in your head. Sure, yeah, it's it's quite simple actually. I worked as a junior engineer at the time, one of my first programming jobs, with a consultancy that um, we worked on, you know, different projects every couple months, and you might want to hop on and help a coworker with a different project. And um, one of the things I was frustrated with in my work was that uh, my dependencies would get completely uh, overlapping, and not dependencies like programming language dependencies, but like my Apache version or my Ruby version or whatever, like global dependence would get uh, messed up. And I was thinking I'd really like a way to, you know, uh, metaphorically what I was thinking was if you think about like a Windows computer or something, metaphorically I wanted to like double click the customer and just like get their environment, right? And I think the, you know, virtual desktops and stuff were a thing even then, but I think the other constraint on me as a university student was I had no money. And so I needed to do this in a way where I wasn't paying an hourly fee or I wasn't, you know, having multiple laptops or something like that. And so that, you know, engineering is all about constraints. And that within the constraints that I had, I had to figure out a way to do this free and local, basically. And that, at the time, the only free hypervisor uh, that was cross-platform was VirtualBox. So I took that one. Um, I was a Ruby programmer, so I used Ruby. And I started just sort of hacking things together to see if I could make this thing work. And what what um what sort of made you open source that or at what point did you open source that project? Sure, I mean I think the there's a couple things. One is that open source is really uh, I don't think I would you know be nearly where I am as a programmer or an engineer without open source because uh, I originally was self-taught. I, I did eventually go to university for computer science, but I started programming when I was 12, and you know my parents didn't want to spend money on these programming books because they're expensive it's not like a book that's like a novel that's you know maybe like ten dollars or something like a programming education book was like 50 us dollars it was like my parents were like no definitely not um so uh i found zip files of source code online that's sort of you know without git or anything i just found like people uploading tars or zips and i figured that out and i would just read source code and that's how i kind of learned how to do stuff um, and yeah, so it wasn't really a choice in that sense for me uh, because open source was core to how I thought about things. And then the other side, which I think is equally very important, especially sort of for the context of our conversation, is that I had absolutely zero intention of ever starting a business, ever making money, <laughs> any money at all around Vagrant or, you know, yeah, Vagrant. I mean, I never crossed my mind. And so, like, the complexities of, building a business around open source were a non-issue because I was not going to build a business around open source at the time. So, yeah, so that was lesson two. Um, so lesson three, uh, this is probably the, the, the sort of toughest problem that we had because um, we knew, you know, we knew how to engineer software. We knew a little bit about sort of marketing and talking to community and, you know, speaking to customers and things like that. Um, but we had no idea about um, the, the license to choose. We knew what we wanted, um, or we knew what we, what we wanted to defend against, I guess, um, but we really didn't know, you know, what the best license was to achieve those goals. And I don't know about you, but I, I can't, I'm just physically inca incapable of reading legal documents. As soon as you get, you know, your first sentence that runs on about 15 times, my brain stops. Um, so yeah, there's a chooseralicense.com is really helpful um, for me where it you know it just boiled down the different licenses um, and 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 you know really you know fundamentally pragmatically what they what they mean for you, your project, your liabilities, and and your business. Um, and this is one of the things that's been interesting about the podcast is that there's a whole really, really, really wide variety of opinions and approaches and um, positions on which license to choose. And interestingly, everyone, everyone felt like, I think everyone, most, most of the people I spoke to felt like they were on the right license for them, but there were a whole variety of different licenses that were being used. Um, we chose BSD3, um, but uh, I spoke to David Kramer, um, of, who's founded Sentry, and he had some really interesting things to say because they've had quite a few problems um, with people 
uh, abusing their code and abusing their license. So talk about the gigs. It's, in, it's interesting. People mention Elastic, but it's kind of like the example of one, pretty much, right? And you're right. Like it's not like they got extinguished out of existence by any stretch, is it? So it's, I don't quite know why so much focus is put on that. I don't know. Maybe it's just because it's Amazon and they're this huge, you know, gorilla and blah blah blah. But yeah. So, but so talk about the. Or what, what was the impetus for changing the license in that case? If you weren't worried about AWS. So you know. I mentioned I'm like this big focus person. I, I hate when I have to spend energy on like, nobody wants to be frustrated all the time, right? Like you want to be able to spend your energy in a way that's productive and useful. And one of the ways I became frustrated over time was we would see startups, almost always startups, come in basically like copy paste century, like pieces of it and things like that. And I'd be like, well, it's legal because the license says so. Like literally even our documentation, they would just be like, well, we copy pasted this entire page, but it's open source, it's legal. Right. And to the point where I actually had to go like, we would have people take our SDKs, which are free open source still today, and they would just fork the thing and not attribute us in the license. And I'd have to go be like, hey, you realize this is illegal. Like I can take down your entire project and then they would go fix it kind of thing. But I'm so tired of having conversations with that about that, especially with our server code. And then at some point there was also a company, a pretty re like a larger than us company that was trying to distribute Sentry. And I'm like, why would we help you do these kinds of things? Like, it, you don't contribute back. You're not helping us build a business which funds everything, right? Funds not only development of Sentry, but it keeps, you know, everybody paying for everything that they have for concerns in life, like that works for us that develop Sentry, right? And so those things were just really annoying. They weren't a threat to the business, but they were annoying in the sense of like, they, from an ethical point in our like moral high ground, we're like, we don't like this and we don't want to spend energy on this. So we changed the BSL license and it effectively has squashed all of those concerns. Now, I will say day one of us converting to this license, somebody's like, I'm going to fork Sentry and it's going to still be free and then I'm going to build a new Sentry. And it's like, no, you're not, but like, good luck to you kind of thing. <laughs> and I think that was a good move because it's at least, we don't have to think about it anymore. If somebody does this, we're just going to straight up go like submit a cease and desist. And again, these are not like individuals that are like nice people just making mistakes. We wouldn't like go after them, but it's like a company that has, you know, $50 million from venture capitalists just you know, not playing fairly. They weren't taking the whole thing and just putting a new like badge on it. They were taking sort of components of it and then sort of encapsulating their stuff around that. Yeah, so, you know, it's always hard to say what has been used and what hasn't because we can only see what's publicized sure. in open source, of course. So most people do not have an open source product. So I could not tell you who has and who hasn't used our server code. It's right. fine if they do, whatever. Open source is for learning as well as everything else. But when it was things like using our SDKs, again, which is fine, but they're not contributing back, they're just forking it, or using our documentation, which is just straight up, what the hell, like annoying, why would you do yeah. that kind of thing? Yeah. Again, it was just this frustrating thing that we'd see it, and it's like, can you? why are you doing this? And like, to where I'd have to have conversations with their lawyers. I'm like, I'm not a lawyer, but I'm gonna explain what's gonna happen if you don't address this situation. <laughs> Okay, so lesson four. Um, this is probably my favorite. So yeah, small teams can be a superpower. So as I mentioned earlier, we, we kind of bootstrapped Flagsmith um, using engineering resource from the software agency that I was running. Um, but they were really, really limited. Um, you know, quite often everyone in the company would be busy and no one would be working on Flagsmith. And, you know, that was fine. That was how we paid the bills. Um, sometimes we'd literally be getting a few hours a week of time um, to, to spend working on, on Flagsmith. Some of us worked on it. We kind of, we kind of got into it, um, and it was lovely being able to write code um, without a, a customer sort of telling you how they want it to be or, or, or you know, making decisions for you. Um, but we, we had very, very limited resources to, to build the initial versions of the platform. And initially, um, you know, we were intimidated. There were these huge closed source companies, um, you know, the biggest one in the market, in our market space. They've raised $330 million. And it's like, you know, they've got, team, you know, a huge team of engineers. Um, you know, there's no way we can compete with that. But we, we sort of realized as we started picking up pace, um, that a combination of small teams uh, you, building on open source frameworks and, and elastic infrastructure can be a superpower. 
Um, you know, WhatsApp had 32 employ uh, engineers at the time that they got acquired. And with 32 engineers, they were supporting 450 million users. Um, we're, <laughs> we're not quite at that scale, but we, we're serving billions of flags a month on our SaaS platform now. Um, and we have three engineers. So we realized that, you know, this constraint can actually, in a way, it can work to your advantage. Um, and I spoke with Jason, uh, who he's the co-founder and CEO of TypeSense. They're, um, they've got an interesting product. They're a search product, like an in-memory search, search database. Um, and yeah, he, he kind of, he, they're a very, very small bootstrap team as well. Um, and he had, he had similar, similar opinions. I think, it, I think it really helps with your product direction, is what I'm saying, is that scarcity of resource is really powerful. Yeah, and I think that's a very good point in that right now, I would say us being a two-person team is actually a big competitive advantage that we have in that if we need to build a feature, we, as the folks that are also implementing it, can directly talk to the user that's going to be using it, get feedback in real time, and implement it and you know be done with it it's it's there are no other dependencies on between us and shipping a feature into the product and that is super like that's like a superpower i would say you know we like we don't do elaborate roadmap plannings and we don't do like we intuitively know just based on user asking us we kind of know that okay in the next three months here's what we're going to be working on so we have that in our mind and that, you know, there's no elaborate meetings for roadmap alignment and you know, all of the things that, again, not bad things, but things you have to do once you have a large team that you need to get everyone aligned on working on similar similar goals. I think being small right now is helps us focus on one thing at a time because we literally have no choice. <laughs> I mean, sometimes let's say we get something that is taking too long, we do switch to something else and, and quickly see if we can fix that and then come back to something. but. Being able to also do something like that, where you know, like for example, we had a feature planned in uh, a plan for actually February geo search. That's something that people have been asking for. We had planned for it in geo search, but then after working on it, realized oh, there's this performance implication to adding this feature, so it's going to take a while for us to figure out what the issue is. Uh, and so we paused that and we said, okay, let's punt on that. There are other these other pressing things that have come through in the meantime, so we started working on it. So. I think having that flexibility to move things around and not being committed to things one way or the other and being able to respond to user feedback in real time, I think is, uh, and also, like you said, reducing the communication overhead that typically larger teams start inheriting. I think that all of that does not exist in a small team. And that's something that's been a, you know, such a nice time saver at this point in time. Of course, it's, you can't, I don't think you can ever be, well, let's see, you can never be a two-person team forever. <laughs> but at this time, at this stage, I'm definitely enjoying all of the benefits that come with a, uh, with a small team. Yeah, so they're, they're just, they're two guys, you know, they're two guys working together. Um, and again, yeah, they're, they're building a product that's going up against a, a really, really, um, you know, heavily funded uh, commercial competitor. Uh, okay, yeah, so this was the another thing. This is lesson five. So getting to the commercial in commercial open source can take a long time. So this was one of the things that was consistent across pretty much every single person that I spoke to. Um, there was years that went by from the inception of the product, product project um to to really it to be it becoming um a, a you know a, a business entity that could stand on its own two feet um when we started flagsmith we we didn't do it because we wanted to build a you know huge business that could buy us all an island um we just wanted it to exist um and it it didn't exist so we started to build it um but that was five years ago um and after about a year and a half or so, um, we realized that people wanted to pay us. So, um, you know, we had this really um, sort of creakily designed website. Sorry, Neil. Um, 
that we'd spent you know a few hours on and um you know I was, I was in the in the pub after work having a drink one day with the team and started to get a message from the the website chat you know from this huge um american healthcare company wanting us um to give them a quote for a um an enterprise license and um i, I didn't really know what to do at that point um and it took us a while to figure out, you know, who the people were that were, were contacting us and, and trying to, to, to give us money. Um, you know, how, how we charge them, what we charge them for, what, what the business model was, and why they wanted to pay us was the big thing that um, it took us time to figure out. Um, but we, we, were, we were happy with that, right? Like, we weren't in a rush. We, we, um, we didn't have investors who were breathing down our necks. Um, you know, we, we, we were just building it at our own pace. Um, I spoke with, uh, with Gabriel who, uh, yeah, so he, you know, he co-founded Rocket Chat, which, you know, is sort of a, a, you know, open source competitor to sort of Slack and Discord, was in a sort of like hyper hot market. Um, you know, Slack kind of, you know, created this market and, and very, very rapidly became, um, you know, very, very valuable company. And uh, I was kind of surprised because I would have thought, well, you know, if there's going to be any sort of project um, that can grow quickly, it would be um, it would be something like Rocket Chat. No, it, it, it took us a while to figure it out. Like we didn't monetize a, almost anything for the first year and a half, almost two years. We tried to create uh, the obvious route to like, okay, should we sell support? And then, yeah, we can sell support. Like you have a, a, a support contract for a few companies but that doesn't like necessarily scale then we start playing out with uh, to sell a SaaS version of our product um, which also started to get some traction but immediately understood that oh, we are competing then too much directly with slack or or, or uh, others that offer like this free version and so on so it wasn't really a, a, a game changer uh, and it was only when we created the license for the enterprise and I started to remember what the guys on MongoDB were talking about on selling like uh, uh, auditing tools, reporting tools, uh, 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 scalability like package. So we started to create our microservice uh, uh, APIs and put those things on the enterprise and offer those on the enterprise package is when we started to see the traction. But that was already 2019. By that, oh wow! By that okay. Point. So, yeah. So wow. because we got, we only got the funding on 2017. So uh, uh, the first from uh, from 2015 when it had the first comment uh, until and uh, uh, it started to get traction, I was bootstrapping and trying to fund everything out of my my pockets or and my 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 friends and family pockets. Uh, so uh, and and. By end of 2016 is when I talked talk to the to the guys in EA. They made an investment in 20, like the, the third of the year of 2017. And then I started building a company. He passed away. So I I, I think I missed a lot of his, uh, uh, I don't think, I know that he, I, I didn't get his influence to, and his knowledge about how to move things faster and, and, and playing faster with finding a business model that work and playing with the, the monetization correctly. So by the time we figure out monetization, it was already like 20, uh, uh, 2019. Um, and then when we had selling on-prem license for people who were looking for uh, high degrees of customization, but also like the sovereignty, data ownership and security. And then start having customers like the US Navy, the Air Force, or like uh, Credit Suisse, Deutsche Bank, uh, like start to have a lot of different large corporations which are willing to spend six figures, seven figures on on security and privacy and customization. So yeah, so that was that was like four years between um, the inception of the project and then starting to uh, you know get traction uh, commercially. Okay, so uh, it's an off by one error here. Um, I said five lessons, but um, you know, off by one error has happened. So there's my final lesson, which is, um, you know, in my opinion, and you know, a lot of the people that I spoke to, I, sort of, I've, I reiterated this, this thought that open, open source uh, software and, and the cloud, in particular, a combination of those two things, 
are eating the world. Um, so yeah, I've, I've been working in software engineering for 27 years. Um, and over that time, more and more software uh, and, and tooling, and frameworks and infrastructure tooling um, has become open. So uh, back in the day before I started my agency, uh, I was working for a, um, a digital agency in London. Um, and we, were, we were working on the Woolworths website. Um, and uh, in production, the Woolworths website was charged $50,000 per CPU per year for, for a Java application server um, called ATG Dynamo. And um, that was normal. That was what they needed to use um, at the time to, to, to power that website. Um, and funnily enough, I'd forgotten the name of the, 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 the application server. When I, I remembered it when I was writing this talk, um, ACG Dynamo, for those of you who are old enough to remember that, it was a bit of a doyen of the original dot-com boom. And um, <laughs> ironically, does anyone know who owns ATG now? Um, so it got bought by Oracle, which I thought was <laughs> quite poetic. Um, you know, but if you tell people now that they need to pay you $50,000 per CPU per year to run an application server um, to build a... a an e-commerce portal, um, you know, they just wouldn't believe you. Um, and this, this, uh, this kind of idea was reiterated uh, when I spoke to Mike Driscoll, um, his founder and CEO of Real Data. They, they work with a lot of big data, and he had this to say. Probably the way I think often about open source is when we think about folks who study kind of industry and the maturation of industries, you kind of and folks like Clay Christensen and Jeffrey Moore, business authors have written about this, you have kind of periods of innovation and periods of commoditization. And so traditionally during periods of innovation, companies would, what was proprietary, what was their kind of unique edge was something that no one else could do or very few folks could do. And they would charge a lot of money for that proprietary database or that proprietary web server. I think if we look at my view of the history of open source, it's essentially a commoditization wave that started at the sort of lowest level operating systems and then sort of slowly makes its way kind of up the stack from operating systems to programming languages to databases. And so I guess I would say in general, you're probably correct that as technologies mature, they tend towards becoming more open source. Probably the other axes here is not what the technologies are, but how they're delivered. And so the new axis of innovation is the movement from the desktop environment to, or the server environment to, I would call it cloud services. And so I think that's where there's so much innovation that you can almost feel like databases are so commoditized. You really have the emergence of someone like Snowflake, which is a commercial database provider, and their axis of innovation is on they've innovated on delivery of the software as a pure cloud service. And so I think those are, if anyone wanted to run a database, fair to say that you don't need to pay anyone to run a database on your own local server. But when you add the layer of running it at scale, elastically in the cloud, then that I think is challenging. And so I think those are just kind of orthogonal axes of innovation and one is mature and the other is not. Right. Yeah, so that's it. That's uh, turns out my yeah the six lessons that I've learned, um, and yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Yeah. Do you think that the sort of initial values of open source are dead, or now you've just become another way of commercializing software development? Yeah, it's funny actually. Uh, so uh, I was talking to my friend Chris here about that last night, like, um, I, this is the first, like, you know, open source conference I've been to, right? Like, I've, I've been to, you know, South by Southwest and places like that. Um, and one of, the, one of the things, one of the, I, I think one of the reasons that I wanted to speak to people about the podcast and one of the big things that I kind of wasn't sure about, and at the start of the talk I said about, you know, I wanted to know what is okay and what isn't okay. And, um, I kind of wasn't sure if it if it was okay. Um, 
one of the things I've noticed coming to this conference this week is that I still think there's a lot of differences of opinion, and I don't think any one of any any of these positions is is right or wrong in any way. You know, is what what does it mean to be open source anymore? Um, I mean, you you can run our platform, you can download it from GitHub. You can have it running in, in Docker in a couple of minutes on your laptop, um, and you can use it in your in your um, in your applications, um, and and that's all free and it's you know it's BSD three licensed, um, and we have this really hard time trying to figure out what features should be closed, right? And it's like, should any of them be closed? Um, would we be able to sustain the project and the business and the employees? Um, by opening them all. Um, and I guess we're afraid of doing that, right? Because we, we, we want to carry on as a team and as a project. Um, and to do that, we need a commercial element. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I, and I think it depends on what you're building, right? Like we're building a full you know, application and SDKs in 50, 14 different languages and, you know, it's like quite a lot of moving parts and things going on. Um, but yeah, we're built on, on Django um, and, you know, we don't pay Django anything. Um, and I, 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 I still don't know if that's quite right, you know. Um, one of the things that I didn't learn from the podcast was whether it was or not, right? Like, and everyone has different opinions, different opinions on that. Like Rails, I mean, you know, they, 37 Signals, Basecamp, David Hein and Hansen, you know, he hasn't made any money directly out of Rails, right? But he's made a very successful business on building applications on top of it. Um, I think that, the, you know, the idea of like it being a bit imposter syndrome-y, you know, um, is still there, yeah. I, I'm still, I, I still don't feel comfortable entirely. I don't think I ever will, really. Yeah. Thanks. Great talk. Thank you. Um, I'm curious, how important is it for you to have a community, and in particular a contributory community, around the open source project, given your other aims that you have? And is it a, if you do, sorry, two parter, uh, <laughs> is it a, a, a blessing or a curse? So one of the, one of the lessons that didn't make it was, um, and again, this was pretty much everyone I spoke to, if you've got a commercial business like, like Sentry um, or Terraform, almost all of the core code is written by people that are paid to write it, right? Um, there's con there's, there, there is a community that exists, and they make contributions. But they, by, you know, almost throughout everyone that I spoke to, um, you know, people generally aren't contributing to, I don't know, the core of InfluxDB's database engine, right? Like they're working, they're, they they might contribute on, and not that this isn't any less valuable documentation or, um, you know support or you know triaging issues or things like that um but yeah they they um they they the the well, i mean we have contributors but it's mainly like small things around the edges right um and and you know and and so I mean, we do have you know we have a discord server that people ask us questions in and people we have a discussion board on github and, and things like that um but I don't, I don't think we've really reached the, for us anyway, we haven't really reached that size where we're like, you know, it doesn't really feel like a community yet, right? Like it's not, um, you know, yeah, people getting together and sharing ideas about what it could be. Sorry, what was, this, what was the second question? If you have contributions, is that, is that helpful or not? Yeah, I mean, you know, like we love people contributing. The other thing I didn't um, mention was, um, uh, there was a project that I interviewed and they had a 10,000 line PR out of nowhere which was um, the entire platform translated into Spanish um, but it had taken them like two months and then they had this big problem of merging that merging that back in so 
I mean, that I, that, I think that does happen from time to time. But, um, yeah, I mean, we as their contributors are slowly increasing, but it's, it's, it's generally around the periphery, around um, raising bugs and, and things of that nature, yeah. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks for coming and, and listening. Thank you.